Hi everyone, I'm Shane Allsop, eLife's Community Engagement Assistant, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to August's ECR Wednesday webinar. Now, if you're unfamiliar, this series aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. You can follow us on Twitter at eLife Community and with the hashtag ECR Wednesday, and the session is being recorded and will be made available on YouTube in the near future. So the ECR Wednesday webinar series is usually led by members of the Early Career Advisory Group. However, it brings me great pleasure today to welcome Vid Nukala, Adriana Bankston, Louisa F., F. Shaveria King, Namita Pandey, who are not only today's panellists, but are also members of eLife's 2022 cohort of community ambassadors, alongside today's chair, Nick Bokosinski. So please join me in welcoming Nick and our panellists. Thank you, Shane, and hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today for our ECR Wednesday webinar on getting involved in global science policy. Um, as Shane mentioned, my name is Nick Pokorzynski, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Yale School of Medicine and an eLife Community Ambassador, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. And so we're going to be using both Zoom and Otter AI to provide live transcription services today. And you can enable the Otter AI system in the upper left-hand corner of your screen if you simply click the custom live streaming service and then select view stream on custom live streaming service. This will open and display the transcript on a separate window and you can exit out of the window to close the transcript. To enable Zoom's live transcript, uh, click the center button or the center bottom toolbar and then you can click show subtitle. And you can then turn them off by clicking hide subtitle. If you have any difficulties, let us know in the chat box. Next slide, please. Um, eLife is a nonprofit organization that is operating a platform to improve all aspects of research communication by encouraging and recognizing the most responsible behaviors in research. Today, our webinar panelists will discuss science policy, how to get involved, and how to, uh, uh, excuse me, how to effectively communicate your research to policymakers. Following the panelists' presentation and discussion, we will invite questions and comment, comments from the audience. But first, um, let's do some quick housekeeping. And so during the, the webinar, please remember to be respectful, honest, inclusive, accommodating, appreciative, and open to learning from everybody else. Do not attack, demean, disrupt, harass, or threaten others or encourage such behavior. And if you feel uncomfortable or unwelcome on any of these webinars, please contact eLife by email via uh, elife-safety-team at protonmail.com. And we reserve the right to ask anyone to leave and or to deny access to a, subs a subsequent webinar. Um, as mentioned, the session is being recorded and we will make it available on YouTube in the near future. If you need help, please send a chat message directly to Shane. And then following the presentation, we'll be relaying your questions to the panelists. And so to ask a question at any point during the webinar, you can type your question into Zoom's chat box and I'll read out your name and question in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Alternatively, we can uh, enable your microphone so that you can ask your question directly. And now I would like to welcome our speakers. Our first panelist is Vid Nukala, the inaugural Senior Community Engagement Officer at EMBO. And we invite you to share your screen, Vid. Okay, um, thank you, Shane, uh, Elish, Nick, and Elife for inviting me to this webinar. I look forward to the conversations today. Um, my name is Vid Nukala. I come from a small town in India and from an era before computers, internet, uh, and mobile phones existed. At the same time, the common thread over my last 15 years of professional career is international science, technology, and innovation cooperation. So moving clockwise on the, on the slide, my training in science began uh, during my bachelor's in India, after which I moved to US for my PhD. Um, as I neared completion of my PhD in neurobiology, I realized I didn't want to pursue the default academic route. I wanted to stay in science, even if not in the lab. And I explored options, medical degree, science journalism, patent law, 
Um, and ultimately, I settled on science policy as it gave me an opportunity to look at the big picture of research while enabling scientists. Although there were a few postdoctoral fellowships in science policy, I wasn't eligible at that time due to my foreign student status in the US. So to equip myself with the theoretical frameworks um, and to get the credentials, I joined a two-year program in international science and technology policy. To gain practical experience, I served as a fellow and carried out a couple of internships. One of them focused on foresight and governance, other on emerging uh, and dual use technologies, and yet another helped me understand facilitating bilateral collaborations. And a capstone project during my master's on technology uptake took me to Kenya even. So these two years in Washington DC helped me shape my career um, and getting that master's degree was a, perhaps a critical decision for me at least. And moving back to India a decade later, I joined a funding agency where I worked on fellowships to promote brain gain and worked on research integrity policies. Then I moved to a bilateral diplomatic setup at, at an embassy where I worked not only on science, uh, both basic and applied, but also health policy. So this included analyzing policies and developments in both countries that would impact the bilateral relationship to organize high level policy dialogues and delegations. And during uh, this tenure, I worked with governments, industry, academia, multilateral bodies, NGOs, getting a firm foothold as a practitioner of science diplomacy. And after another decade, 10 years working in India, I uh, was ready to step out again, this time in Europe. I currently work at an intergovernmental international organization, supporting and engaging the life sciences community across 40 countries. And getting the policymakers to hear from the scientific community is an important aspect of my role. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and what did I learn on this journey? Um, as you see, I moved across sectors, I moved across subject areas, and I moved across countries and continents. Um, so in science, it could be curiosity-driven or purpose-driven, and we spend a lot of time um, coming up with hypotheses and conducting original research, analyzing the data and publishing in journals uh, or at conferences. Uh, but when you move to policy, uh, it tends to be purpose-driven and it could be at the institutional level, it could be at the national or it could be at international level. Um, you analyze uh, the, the scientific evidence and come up with policies known as science for policy, or you could come up with policies that would in fact impact the science, uh, what and how it's done, and that's policy for science. And in both cases, you are looking at drafting a variety of documents. You are looking at coming up with uh, both the analysis and policy options, and sometimes even recommendations when it becomes advice. Moving on to diplomacy, this tends to be purpose-driven. Um, again, a lot of elements of policy carry over into diplomacy, uh, but perhaps some new elements here, that is uh, negotiating at the bilateral, regional, or multilateral level. And you don't not only look at policy options, but you also have policy positions. You want to know, or you want to be clear with uh, on what you want to go in for these negotiations. And uh, a critically important element is how to navigate the social, cultural, and economic context of the countries or the communities that you are interacting with. Um, and coming to community engagement, uh, things are almost flipped over here. You start with understanding what's the socioeconomic cultural context that you are operating in. It's uh, You try to learn the needs of the scientific community. Um, it's, it's a very um, service-oriented approach and response. Um, you try to build, nurture, and empower the community. And in doing so, you also leverage the knowledge, interests, and skills. So these are sort of very top line, uh, perhaps differences or similarities across these four areas that I have uh, 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 sort of did the boundary spanner. And now are there any mantras? Uh, I think there are four that worked for me. If you look at the circles, 
I think the first step before changing current course is self-reflection. This requires one to pause and take stock of their career trajectory thus far, to identify one's interests and match them with their strengths, or seek opportunities for additional knowledge and skills through continuous learning. Honing on how to communicate in a clear and simple way to a diverse audience is critically important here. The second is be pragmatic and carry out due diligence about the job market, about what you deserve, what's out there. Getting job as a researcher is easier than in policy and diplomacy. There are fewer opportunities. And so you need to be aware of that uh, limitation. There are additional barriers uh, if you want to move into policy and diplomacy, especially such as security clearances, uh, visas. Some of the positions are open to only citizens or permanent residents. So these are the very practical matters uh, that one needs to be aware of, uh, especially if you're crossing countries. The third is networking and volunteering. Seek out organizations and people whose work you are interested in and inspires you, not because they'll offer you a job. Uh, some of them may become your collaborators or mentors. Offer yourself not as a potential employee, but as a resource. Um, and the last uh, mantra I would say is take calculated risks, be curious, and be willing to move out of your comfort zone. Again, whether they are subject sectors or countries, um, so my last key message is straying from the default path can be unsettling and yet exciting brimming with possibilities. After all, the world is large enough to carve and make a mark for oneself. Thank you. Happy to discuss today or later. My LinkedIn contact information is on this slide. Thanks. Thank you, Vid. That was great. Um, our next panelist is Adriana Bankston the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Publisher of the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. I will hand it over to you, Adriana. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. If you'll go to the next slide, please. So my story will be a little bit more US focused, but hopefully still useful. And um, hopefully you'll see there's a common thread um, throughout my career to really support early career researchers in science and in policy, and we'll aim to provide some useful advice as well. So moving um, from left to right here, um, in terms of career exploration, so I, I obtained my bachelor's in science uh, from Clemson in biological sciences and my PhD also in biomedical sciences from Emory University and then did a postdoc um, at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. So again, all my training was in the US. Um, during the postdoc, I started looking for opportunities for career exploration, and there really weren't too many um, being in Kentucky and the, the small uh, postdoc office there. And so I actually started a seminar series uh, at my university, which got me interested in different career options for trainees. Um, so that's one lesson here. If there's a resource that you need uh, that is not there, creating it really will give you a lot of skills. Um, and then also nationally, I got involved with organizations uh, that really worked on training early career scientists. So one example I'm showing here is the National Postdoc Association or NPA, um, which really looks at uh, policies for postdocs. And so started to develop an interest in training the next generation uh, and a little bit of policy, again, through the Kentucky Academy of Sciences, uh, trying to look at what was there in terms of local options. So. Um, so far, this was a good uh, sort of lesson to cultivate both local and national interest in the particular area. So moving on um, from these experiences, I became interested in how we can improve policy to really support early career scientists. And uh, of course, I was still in the lab and looking for a way to, to transition. Um, so I got involved with this nonprofit called Future of Research, which addresses academic systemic change. And through them, um, did advocacy for increased postdoc salaries. So we had a project, a uh, research project looking at postdoc salaries across the U.S. We published and went around to universities to talk about that. Um, and it was a really great way to look at sort of this issue of po postdoc pay more broadly. Um, we also organized a number of symposiums and meetings for early career researchers and published on these topics, including mentoring and other things. 
Um, this experience really was pivotal in my transition and solidifying my interest in academic policy change and what we can do to think about institutional change to support BCRs. Um, and so again, the lesson here would be to sort of take a leap of faith and um, think about what you're interested in. And that could be a good direction um, as you're thinking about leaving the lab if you're interested in this area. Um, so the next thing sort of building on this, uh, the middle point here is how, how do you build, build, your, build your skills? Um, so now knowing really that I was interested in policy related to academia and looking for a way to actually transition this into a career. Um, so I, again, looked at organizations that I was already uh, already involved with. So given the NPA, uh, I got involved with their pub, their uh, advocacy committee. So again, another tip, uh, if you're already involved with their organization, um, try to find out options for communications and policy that they may have uh, in addition to research opportunities. The other sort of big experience here was with the American Society for Cell Biology. So again, this was my um, sort of scientific discipline. I went to the meeting, presented my research, and uh, started getting involved more with their policy um, areas, and then joined their public policy committee, which is really instrumental uh, in learning how policy actually works and seeing how a society does that. Um, so I contributed to projects, again, related to postdoc policies, uh, wrote policy statements, contributed to um, a number of projects, um, attended advocacy meetings, um, and also had some leadership roles as well. And then um, really it was useful for, for connecting with uh, leadership in the society as well. And so um, this really, as I was transitioning um, through this process of now solidifying my interest in policy, um, starting doing more networking with professionals in the field, um, and then also de developed really a strong interest in training the next generation in policy. Um, and this is sort of where the journal fits in, and we'll talk about that. Um, but I think sort of from this section, um, I would say uh, seeking opportunities to gain the skills that you'll need um, in policy positions is helpful as you're transitioning and thinking through how to how to gain them. So moving on, uh, the fourth uh, bullet here is uh, really, again, another big step. Um, now knowing that I was interested in um, policies around academia and the workforce, my sort of official transition, I guess, um, into the field was through a policy and advocacy fellowship with the Society for Neuroscience. Um, and this is where, where I really understood how things work. Um, this position was very much focused on advocacy. I learned a lot of basic skills. Again, uh, events, writing policy documents, contributing to a newsletter, and also reviewing applications for one of the training programs and so on. Um, so this was a really big sort of plunge to, to shift into this field uh, was very daunting, but really what I needed to do to kind of step out and, and make this commitment to the field. Um, and then lastly, to my current position. Um, so I currently work for University of California and advocating for the system at the federal level with Congress, the administration and federal agencies, uh, which is another big role um, that I stepped into uh, and learned how to, how to navigate it. But um, here again, a few examples of what I do uh, include advocating for federal funding for research, organizing advocacy events, meetings with legislative staff, writing letters and other documents. And also we have involved um, trainees in a number of our advocacy events and also engage with federal agencies uh, to discuss the grant opportunities. So uh, this was another big decision that I, I took on this role, not really knowing how I would do it and uh, sort of learn how to do it on the job. Um, that's another lesson, so something else to consider. So that's all to say um, kind of how I've come to my current role. Happy to talk more, but I want to transition now to tell you a little bit about the journal um, as that was a part of my role and also um, as a CEO, if you'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So on the left side here, I'll just give you a brief background um, about the journal of science policy and governance. So this could be a good stepping stone for you in policy. JSPG is an international open access and peer reviewed journal. 
Uh, we publish policy work from early career authors from every corner of science and technology policy in a variety of formats. Um, it's uh, You can submit from anywhere in the world. We were established uh, about 10 years ago and provide opportunities not only for publishing, policy research and writing, um, but also a forum for debate and discourse. And we really try to get uh, published ideas out, or, out there and discussing um, what the next generation is publishing. Um, and with that, in addition to being a journal, we're also an outlet for professional development and policy. So prior to submission deadlines, we organize a number of webinars and writing workshops and policy that you can sign up for to help prospective authors um, in preparing their submissions. Um, we post all of our recordings on YouTube, and so you can, you can view past trainings as well. Um, we also have additional opportunities to get involved besides publishing, which are through the editorial board um, and also our ambassador program that we started this year. Uh, you can learn more about that on the website. So to give you just a brief flavor of some of our activities, um, here's our, lat our latest issue that we published this week on innovations in science diplomacy. Um, and we currently have a call for papers open on digital health and also more opportunities for publishing coming in 2023 uh, for our different issues. So stay tuned for that. Um, you can also see here the associate editor opportunity, uh, which is still open until September 4th. Uh, another good way to learn about policy writing and editing and play a role in the direction of the journal. So I encourage you to apply to the editorial board. Um, on the right side, um, a sort of the flip side of this is we have opportunities for published authors, as I said, to to publish to talk about published work um, through presentations to partners. So you can see here a presentation that was given by authors to the British Embassy staff. Um, conference panels, which I'm not showing. Uh, the podcast that we have, we started this a couple of years ago to provide another model, um, sort of medium for for folks to talk about published work. And um, it's now on, on multiple platforms, something else you can subscribe to uh, to hear from what our authors are doing. And we're trying to ramp up our media engagement um, to really get uh, either universities or other outlets to promote published work. Um, so I'm showing one article here from Northwestern about graduate students who published in JSPG and uh, highlighted their published work here. So that's a nice, nice article to look at. Um, we also have a newsletter that you can subscribe to for future updates, and I'll share uh, some of the links in the chat after this. So happy to talk more about the journal as well. I just wanted to give you a little background, uh, but um, my last slide is really sort of lessons learned, I guess, some recommendations. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So through my story, um, I am a bit already touched up on some of this, and I suspect we'll have a lot of common uh, advice here. But uh, my, I always advise trainees to explore options early. Don't wait until you're a postdoc, uh, it, even though I did that, and you don't also don't have to do a postdoc. Um, but explore early. Um, find a policy area that you're interested in. Look for opportunities and organizations that are involved in that, working on those issues so you can start building your brand and reputation. Um, get involved in both local and national organizations. Again, this worked well um, for me. It gives you different types of skills. And joining committees, groups, and organizations, as you've sort of seen through my story, uh, is helpful, especially if you can be a leader in some of them, and that will get you noticed uh, throughout in different areas. Um, also, seek to gain a versatile skill set through these experiences. So one way to do that is to look at uh, which organizations can give you different skills or, or learning things, uh, events, writing, advocacy, et cetera. And um, don't be afraid to explore new opportunities and positions that you might uh, feel excited about, even if they seem a little scary because you'll really grow into it. Uh, that's really probably one of my top pieces of advice. Um, networking and informational interviews can go a long way. Uh, I think anybody who's transitioned is happy to chat about their story and um, that's that's a resource. And then ultimately, and I'll leave you with this, uh, develop your story uh, and path and policy. Everybody has a different story and a different reason why they get in, got involved in the field. They have a different way of getting into it. Um, 
So I told you mine. Uh, so now go build your story. And I'm happy to to chat uh, with any trainees that want to reach out um, about your your path or your interests. Uh, and then you can find my contact uh, on the slide and also JSPG, uh, our Twitter and, and website as well. So thank you. Thank you, Adriana. That was great. Um, now, please welcome our next panelist, uh, which will be Luisa F. Echeverria King. Uh, a researcher at Corporación Universitaria del Caribe and internationalization advisor at Sena. Thank you. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? So uh, I wanted to start uh, my presentation uh, just saying um, that I am a social scientist. Um, when I began my career, um, I just uh, thought that I really wanted to get involved with academia. Um, when I started working at academia, I um, was just, I was without a PhD. I was just, you know, uh, starting uh, my career really, really from the bottom. Um, also teaching uh, a foreign language at the university because I come from the foreign languages um, uh, background. And when I started uh, my career uh, at the university, uh, soon I I uh, got the possibility to start working at the international office. For me, um, it was very interesting because uh, since the beginning of my studies, I uh, I studied abroad. I uh, always have um, been working internationally. So for me, it was pretty natural to start working at the international office of, of that particular university at that point of uh, my career. I was starting my career. And after a, a couple of uh, years, I uh, also got the possibility to manage that international office. So I became a manager as a, a, at a very young age. So I think that possibility also really uh, changed my perspective to have uh, so much responsibility at a very young age to to really try to uh, internationalize a university uh, from a regional perspective also, it was a, a quite a, a challenge. Um, about uh, my formation and training, I just wanted to say that I studied linguistics, translation and cultural studies uh, in Germany at Johannes Gutenberg Universität Mainz. And I have a master's in linguistics and a PhD in education. My PhD, uh, I did it later in my career when I was uh, already uh, working um, as an international officer uh, for a really uh, quite long of time. Um, I wanted to say also that uh, this uh, topic about um, uh, policy advice is really interesting uh, when you when you see it like like in a broader way because when you start your career, uh, when I was started, I I really didn't know that I wanted to do a, a PhD. That that came just along along the way. Um, after after being involved in the university, I got a possibility to go uh, to Bogota and start working as an internationalization advisor and at our Colombian Ministry of Education. Uh, that uh, possibility really uh, opened my mind a lot because uh, uh, in that um, particular uh, position, I had the chance to uh, really advise uh, also many universities uh, to participate in many international uh, key spaces. Uh, and, and, and that really uh, made me understand that as a, as a professional, I, I just didn't want to work at a, at a single institution. I just really wanted to serve um, uh, many institutions and also the government. That was for me clear at that point when I began uh, working at the Colombia Ministry of Education. Um, I also um, had the possibility to join SENA. That's the institution where I'm also working at this point. This is a government-led institution for uh, vocational education uh, in Colombia. We are uh, present in all uh, Colombia. Um, so as, as you could see uh, from the beginning of my career, 
uh, I was also I, I was always involved also in the field of uh, education, tertiary education, higher education. So um, I think that that was also something special because uh, sometimes when you begin your career, you you don't know uh, uh, what you're going to become. But for me, it was very very special to start uh, working in one of my passions, which is um, higher education. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention is that I also I I always take chances. I mean, if I if I see an opportunity, I just go and and get it. I had many opportunities uh, for continuous learning and courses and scholarships uh, during my career. I uh, had the possibility to go. Uh, to a course to Israel, to India, um, uh, also to uh, to Germany with the DAD. So um, what I also can say is that it's really, really important for your career and so that you have also a global perspective uh, from a particular uh, situation or a problem um, is that you, uh, when you have the possibility, of course, to try to apply to those scholarships and, and, and really participate uh, in international courses, also to build a network because uh, when you really are uh, in, interested in these topics about a, a science policy, um, uh, you really have to, to have a network uh, uh, globally uh, so that you can have also a broader uh, impact. Uh, during my career, I was also pursuing my PhD, uh, like at the same time, I didn't leave my career uh, to do my PhD. That's something which is also very common in Latin America. In Latin America, people usually study what they are working, and I also did that. Um, and uh, after pursuing uh, my PhD, I, I, I was always uh, thinking during my PhD about uh, alternative careers, uh, not just, you know, uh, to be a professor at a university. I just thought that that would be for me uh, not enough. I really want more. And I started uh, doing consultancy work. Uh, many of the people that advise uh, policy uh, in a country such as Colombia, they are... Um, academic uh, consultants, that's how we call it. So I, I started doing consultancy work at the beginning, just at universities and also like um, university networks, but afterwards and in, in the year 2020, I began to advise uh, also our Colombian uh, Ministry of Education uh, yeah, officially in the topic uh, of uh, internationalization of higher education. Uh, right now, I am also um, uh, working um, in the first uh, Colombian uh, policy for the internationalization of science, technology, uh, and innovation and science diplomacy in Colombia. This has been also a very interesting journey um, because after um, finishing my PhD, I began also uh, actually doing uh, research um, and and after doing research you also see all the all the bias all the situations all the problems that we have in a country such as colombia and 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 you really uh, try to solve these problems you know and in order to try to solve this problem and also to 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 engage and to influence agendas to influence a policy it is it is important to uh, to really become a leader in the topic that you are uh, uh, researching and also uh, to become um, a leader uh, in uh, associations and networks. And that was something that I really want to, uh, uh, to deliver in this uh, speech, just to really um, engage, engage in different networks, uh, share with different people uh, from all the regions of your country, internationally, globally, and, and start, you know, to share your experiences with them because you are going to be a, a, this advocacy situation really, really pushes your career. That's the, that's what I want to say. And, and I think uh, you learn a lot from other people and other people will also learn a lot from you. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I have uh, here also some key re recommendations. Uh, as I was saying, uh, do advocacy and scientific outreach. I mean, maybe at the beginning it, it looks like more work, but uh, uh, do so is really rewarding uh, in the end. 
because uh, you can you can influence uh, in different agendas all those values and elements of science that that you really want to defend and support. Uh, uh, I have, for instance, my my own. Um, uh, values that I want to defend, maybe you have others. So uh, uh, try to engage and uh, really uh, change the perspective by uh, engaging. Um, I also think that, that it is really important to try to engage in the public sector of your country. I mean, if you really want to advise uh, in the field of Colombia, for instance, or Latin America, national policies, uh, you you try to you really have to try to engage to the public sector, but because if you haven't worked in the public sector at, and at a national level, it is a little bit uh, difficult to really um, uh, influence uh, those those politics and agendas. So please try to engage uh, also with the public sector. Um, I also wanted to say that it's quite important to become a leader. Sometimes you see topics or areas of interest, but um, no one is really working on that topic or you have uh, people that are not really interested in that. So I, I just also wanted to encourage you to really uh, become a leader, to see uh, areas of opportunity, uh, try to connect the dots, establish links, uh, you know, uh, train yourself also. Um, I am also a person that, that uh, as Adriana just said, uh, I, I have learned a lot during, uh, during my actual job. Uh, I, I was not trained as a consultant, of course not. I just really um, 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 like um, learned that by doing. So please, uh, when you see the opportunity, just get it and uh, do your best. And you are going to see that you're going to learn uh, a lot doing that. And I also recommend to attend seminars and trainings uh, on uh, public policy advice. I, I think that's something which is uh, quite interesting, interesting, and you're going to learn a lot. Adriana, for instance, does a lot of those uh, workshops, so you can really also engage on those uh, workshops and seminars, and you're going to learn also other people that are like you, that uh, also want to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, the topic. So that would be also great uh, for your career. That would be my presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to hear uh, your questions. Thank you, Luisa. Uh, our final panelist today is Namita Pandey, postdoctoral fellow at the Indian Institute of Science in Bengaluru, India. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Nick. And uh, first of all, uh, I would just put this disclaimer that I'm recovering from COVID. So kindly bear with my coughing. <laughs> in between and uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, I would request Shane to kindly move to the first slide. Okay, so after listening to Ved, Adriana, Luisa, I don't have much more to say. Maybe I would sound very repetitive at a lot of point, but uh, uh, like Luisa, I, I have my love and hate with science right from my childhood. So I was super curious as a kid and my ardent curiosity to know the hows and whys of nature kind of uh, pushed me to toward science. And I don't know when I fell in love with science. So uh, I got fascinated with uh, my elder brother's book, who is a chemical engineer. My father was a mechanical engineer back home. And but unfortunately, nobody was happy about me taking up engineering. So here comes the gender angle to it. And uh, I come from Bihar, which is a very small, uh, it's, it's one of the backward states in India and education was not very freely accessible. Though I came from a middle class, so preliminary education was very much there. But becoming an engineer was not, no, no, a big no to her. Uh, but I was a rebellious kid, to be very frank. And uh, I thought, let's denounce science. Let's not study science. Let's hate science and forget science forever. But here comes what I would say by chance or by choice. Uh, I started studying economics and... Uh, right next to my department was the science faculty. And I made friends in science departments. And uh, 
during in uh, cafeteria discussions and and even beyond that i got to know more science than people knew in their classrooms and when and why i started up doing science activism right in my college days be it related to climate change be it related to air pollution be it related to uh, hiv advocacy and uh, science policy and advocacy got into my brain in a very subconscious way um i think more from the academic point of view i started more from the civil society backdrop and engaging with civil societies and communities working on science society interface was my first kick towards science policy i believe uh, there was so much of calculation as vid said about calculating risk about uh, thinking about mobility about visa about the career aspirations you have because science policy in india as a discipline existed nowhere so where will i learn science policy and the theories and models so i went back to the community i went back to a lot of professors in fact i started exploring science in my own stream so i was doing economics i started studying evolutionary economics which has so much of inspiration drawn from biology and i landed up doing phd in science policy so the learning over here is no matter where you start i think uh, having the right kind of guidance and choosing your godfather or godmother is one of the very important element so do focus on finding the right mentor for yourself that is very important in your career and uh, as i'll move further i might explain a little more about it now the third section which talks about science policies hey this is a universe full of opportunities unfortunately very few get a chance to explore it exploit it and make good out of it for themselves and for the society uh i would suggest it is important to be very open minded when you begin exploring this whole arena of science policy expose yourself to different perspective interest needs be it be it region be it global national local be it different networks associations of different teams of different sectors i think working with different uh, associations and being a part of it i i think most of us have been talking about network building and uh, discussing about uh, elements like how we create more of a community of science policy so that is very important and uh, the second point also reflects on the fact that it's important to collaborate and when you collaborate it's more about cultivating and open to co-learning and co-creating i think uh, this point comes very relevant for me because after finishing my phd i was quite directionless and uh, i got a project from uh, fao and one of the think tanks in new delhi was doing this project and i needed money because i had finished my phd and i had to work so i jumped into the project i started doing science policy research and uh, to my surprise this one project opened so many opportunities for me that i got exposed to the right kind of stakeholders the kind of people who work in the area of similar interest and uh, this helped me to also identify my present postdoctoral fellowship which is supported by the department of science and technology government of india and which gave me a direct access to work with the public sector with the government at national level and work with one of the ongoing policy making process which is the fifth 
national policy. We are still in the process and uh, it's under the cabinet approval right now. And I was fortunate to work on a theme on gender and inclusion, which circles back to my disenchantment with science. But this is what, uh, you know, it's about chances and choices you make in life. So uh, now I, I also believe that this also made me realize that you cannot really be uh, running like a horse in a race. You have to diversify your work portfolio. I started my PhD with internationalization of innovation, looking at tech clusters. Now I work on gender and science, science diplomacy, inclusive innovation. And I think inclusive innovation is very important, particularly from people coming from the global south and so is grassroots innovation. The discussions around that have so much of relevance and I could see many of our participants are uh, from the global south as well. And I think uh, they should definitely work in these areas because these are unexplored, but very, very relevant for India, for any of these developing countries and uh, the policy making uh, particularly because uh, I believe science policy, as much as it depends on advocacy, as much as it depends on uh, the kind of uh, policy making we do, it also depends on the kind of evidence we create for these policies. So uh, please invest yourself in trying to create the right kind of evidence to make these policies. Next slide, please. Shane. Okay, so quick suggestions. And uh, these suggestions nobody gave to me, so I never followed them. But I believe that these are very important suggestions and wish someone would have given these suggestions to me. One is, of course, start early. Uh, as Adriana said, uh, and uh, I think Luis also touched upon it, uh, the fact that please try to identify your interest and try to build up on that. And you have this amazing platform of eLife community, exploit it. And I think uh, you will find right kind of peer groups, right kind of mentors. Don't become a frog in the well. I was one of the frogs in the well <laughs> for the entire PhD. I thought I'll read and write, read and write without reaching out to scholars, without connecting them, connecting with them. And I believe uh, this was not right. I think it is very important to connect with different scholars, practitioners, the relevant communities, which are very important for the area of interest. Please ask questions, even the stupid ones. Don't hesitate to reach out to people. I think people are very welcoming and open to listen to you. Find your tribe, uh, the kind of work you want to do. Find people who have similar interests and objectives. And I think it is, this would help you to take a leap in your career and uh, do something great in science policy. Keep yourself updated. And it's very important to keep moving on the learning curve. Read, reflect, discuss, deliberate. These are very important points. And I believe uh, this... The, the whole arena of science policy is so dynamic and unpredictable that if you lose onto a point and if you are somewhere stuck in 2020 and here we are in 2022, the debates are transforming in seconds these days. Please keep yourself updated. And uh, as I said, be passionate about what you do because this is such a fascinating, multidisciplinary and complex millionaire. I believe there's so much to offer and contribute. There's no wrong framework, no wrong model. You have to contextualize it. You have to just figure out how to put it. You can start from your home. The beauty about doing science for society through making smaller changes. And I think that is how you could start from. And policies, as I, as I think most of us have been to Durba, I think impacting policies or even to, would also matter a lot how passionate you are for the subject. 
and how all these elements of being in the right community, doing the right kind of research, and how you are trying to engage with the different stakeholders around, as Luisa said, that collaborate, meet, go, be a part of different discussions, be a part of different community. I think that is one way to reach out to the, the larger community of science, uh, science policy and uh, be a part of that. And uh, I'll leave my, uh, my contact details on the slide. And there's a tattoo which is on my leg. So, uh, which is a which is a TNT, and uh, it just reminds me of uh, how at what point I started and where I am right now. And there is never to look back now and go on and on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Namita. That was uh, wonderful, and thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, we're going to move into the Q and A in just a moment. Uh, I believe we've got about seven minutes left on the webinar, so I'll try to be quick with this follow-up announcement here. But I want to let everyone on the call today know that we've actually planned a follow-up science policy in action event for September 26th at 3 p.m. BST, which is the same time as this event. And uh, we've organized that because of the large interest shown by the ECR community in science policy. And so we'll be joined by uh, four other panelists, Naomi Wallace, Hannah Janabdar, Shannon Koslovich, and Emily Myers. Uh, and we'll be discussing how all of whom, they, they all work in various science policy related fields. Um, they're all also friends or colleagues of mine. Um, and so I'm really excited to give them, you know, an opportunity to share their um, careers, career paths with you and some of their work and experiences. They are all also recently graduated PhDs, so um, they definitely will be able to kind of, I think, uh, bring that ECR perspective uh, to the community. And so with that, um, oh, and I believe that Shane is actually going to drop a link to the registration for that event in the chat. Um, and then with that, I'm going to move on into the Q&A. Um, and so... Let's see. I think the first question here, I don't, it's from the early career advisory group. I don't know who specifically. Um, and this question is, I think is directed towards the panel, generally speaking. Um, but they want to know kind of what a typical day working in science policy looks like. And maybe everyone could just share kind of a, a quick thought about what their day looks like and maybe, you know, how that's changed throughout their career a little bit. I imagine it changes quite a bit <laughs> depending on your role. Um, I can go uh, just very briefly. So it all depends on the context, the setting and, and the role you are in. Um, and it could be any of the following things. Uh, uh, this could be drafting policies, looking at scientific evidence, uh, this could be analyzing policies um, and see whether they're working or not and what needs to be tweaked and evaluating policies. Uh, this could be communicating policies. This could be negotiating policies. So it just depends on uh, which which context you are in. So uh, I, I know that's not a, uh, a, a very specific answer, but uh, just, yeah, I, I think, yeah, it, it depends on where you are. and. Uh, what you're setting out to do. Luis, I see you have your hand raised. Would you like to go next? Yes. Um, in Colombia, for instance, uh, as I was saying, we are working in, in our internationalization uh, of STI policy and science diplomacy. And for that, um, we we go to different uh, places of Colombia and, and we gather with people we are um collecting data for instance that's that's something which is also part of the job meetings many meetings also with the ministry of course um our ministry of sti uh, also analyzing data also uh, meetings between the team so that we can be uh, all uh, so so that we can all agree on on what we are going to um to be um proposing 
Uh, so it it is different. And for an academic consultant, that's usually how, how the work uh, looks like. It's, it's very like on the field and meetings and uh, data analyzing and stuff like that. So if I can add to that, um, so for me, it depends on the time of year and also wanted to point out that there is a difference between policy and advocacy as well. So we really, you know, my job is very much focused on advocacy, which is pushing priorities of the university with different constituencies, strategies that go into that and who you reach out to when you're trying to push specific policy and so on. Um, we do a lot of it through advocacy events, either meetings with legislative staff, different offices, uh, other universities, other higher ed organizations that uh, are pushing similar topics, um, writing priority documents, of course, and so and and the following legislation. So that's again specific to my role that uh, we do follow all the bills that are are going on and moving around in, at the federal in the federal level as well. So. Um, I'm happy to chat more, but that's just my kind of my specific uh, activities. Adriana, I'm wondering maybe you can expand on that a little bit because the second part of this question is actually um, related to what the most important or rewarding change in policy that you've had the opportunity to bring about, what, what that might've been and kind of how long it took to go from you know envisioning that goal to seeing it happen. Yeah, so there's two things I'll mention. One is, um, I mentioned this in the introduction, but uh, engaging trainees more in our advocacy efforts, and that's really paid off during the pandemic. We organized a uh, panel with grad students and postdocs in the system um, with legislative staff talking about their experiences and how uh, the pandemic impacted them. And that really did lead to some uh, legislative language down the road to really help them. And now I think there's a lot more interest in the pipeline and what the research system will look like post pandemic and all that kind of stuff. So just from one event, um, the other major thing, which again is a long process and will uh, tells you about how long the legislative process takes, but um, you probably, if you if you've seen um, the recent bill that was signed into law uh, last couple of weeks ago, I guess, um, Chips and Science Act um, includes a section on graduate education, uh, different programs for grad students and postdocs. So that was language that we actually drafted probably about a year and a half ago or so. It was in a different bill. It's a long story. The bill got attached to a number of other ones and eventually got into chips, which passed. And it now is a law, uh, which is really exciting. So I actually wrote a section um, for the bill to provide postdocs with professional development opportunities and funding. Um, so if that all goes through and the funding goes through, uh, we'll see next year, that'll be a program that will be uh, implemented and, and that'll happen. So uh, it, it takes a long time uh, not to go too deep into the legislative process because it can be convoluted, but uh, it's nice to get to this point and just to see that your ideas are incorporated um, is a big deal. So hopefully we'll see that actually implemented. Well, I think because we are at time, we're going to uh, wrap it up there, but uh, I encourage everyone to um, reach out to our panelists if you have any other questions. I think that they've all shared various forms of contact information throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you all for being here and thanks again to all the panelists.